Hey there, it's Lacey. When you close your eyes and you think Russian hacker, what do you see? Is it a guy in a hoodie, maybe, hunched over a computer in the dark? It's almost cliche at this point. The big bad Russians hiding behind their screens, wreaking havoc from halfway across the world. But these guys have done some really bad things. They've interfered with U.S. elections, shut down pipelines, and locked up computer systems and then demanded a ransom. And there's this podcast that I've been listening to that doesn't just cover some of these hackers. They actually talk to them. It's called Click Here, and it's hosted by former NPR investigations correspondent Dina Temporastin. Recently, she and her team tracked down one of Russia's most notorious cyber criminals, a guy who goes by the name Wazawaka. The FBI had added him to their most wanted list, but Wazawaka doesn't really seem to care. He's still posting videos of himself and even talking about it all with the Click Here podcast. So have a listen, because this is one we thought you should hear. The FBI's most wanted list is the stuff of legend. Back in the old days, it included gangsters like Al Capone or bank robbers like John Dillinger, even Bonnie and Clyde the murderous lovers who went on a three-year crime spree in the 1930s before they were eventually gunned down in their car by law enforcement. Here is Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker, who died as they lived, by the gun. To get that most wanted public enemy number one designation, the person needs to be a danger to society. And the FBI has to make a calculation whether all the publicity that comes with the FBI's most wanted will help the Bureau bring them to justice. What may be less well-known is that the FBI has a bunch of different kinds of most wanted lists. There's one for fugitives, one for kidnappers, and somewhat recently, one for the world's most wanted hackers, people who have wreaked havoc from behind a keyboard. The actors named in this indictment were members of a hacking group operated in China. Involved hacking into computers of hospitals, municipalities, public institutions and businesses in the United States and... In and the people countries. on the FBI's cyber most wanted seem to fall into a couple of categories. Iranian hackers with first names like Amir and Ahmad, North Koreans with last names like Park and Kim, and Chinese hackers, many of whom appear to be in military uniform. And the newest inductee? He's Russian. His first name is Misha, but he's better known by his screen names. Wazawaka, or Boris Elson, or M1X. And back in the spring, he landed on that most wanted list. We are following new developments this morning and an apparent hack affecting D.C. police's computer network. Health care providers, school systems, all targets of a Russian national. The Justice out. Department is putting a bounty on his head to the tune of $10 million. He's worked with some of the most notorious cyber criminals in the world. And the Department of Justice claims the groups he's worked with have raked in hundreds of millions of dollars by stealing data and then holding it for ransom. And we tracked down this most wanted hacker, thought to be living in Russia, and we convinced him to talk. And he has a lot to say about his inclusion on that FBI list. I just want to say this. The money that the DOJ attributes to me, I have never seen such amounts. I don't have this money. Where did they get those numbers from? I'm interested. I'm Dina Temple-Raston, and this is Click Here, a podcast about all things cyber and intelligence. Today, a conversation with one of America's most wanted. Stay with us. The FBI's cyber most wanted started about 10 years ago, and the criteria to be included is pretty straightforward. It depends on the seriousness of the hacking crimes, the kinds of attacks they've committed in the past, and whether they continue to pose a serious threat. Misha seems to have made the cut largely because of the people he hangs out with. He's been an affiliate, which is a kind of contractor, to three infamous ransomware hacking crews, namely Lockbit, Babook, and Hive. Though when we asked him about them, he started out by not wanting to talk about it. We spoke to him through a translator. I have discussed this many times, and there is no reason to repeat it. But then he went on to discuss them at great length. 
He says a lot of people have accused him of running some of these ransomware gangs, but actually, that's not right. He says he just works with them. Journalists exaggerate more than make mistakes. But there are mistakes. For example, Hive and Lockpit. They made me look like a co-owner of this. Which he says he isn't. But even if he isn't running these groups, because he's worked with so many of them, he's a wealth of information about how they operate. For example, he says he thinks the best-run ransomware operation is a Russian-language one called Conti. Conti was very well structured. You've probably heard about some of their attacks. Conti targeted the Costa Rican government last year and stole some 850 gigabytes of data from the finance ministry. Late today, we learned that Costa Rica has declared a state of emergency after a ransomware attack. El gobierno informó esta mañana que el grupo Conti the group made a ransom demand and then just locked up the financial ministry's systems for weeks. They doubled their ransom demand from $10 million to $20 million. They can do things like that, Misha said, because they are so well run. It was run like a real-world business, and they profited from that. Lockpit or Rival claimed others' work and boasted about other people's work. That's why they lost their way. You will not find anything bad written about Kanzi. They keep all their business promises. The product is well built. Conti broke up shortly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Its leaders said they were going to support Russia in the war. And then, in response, someone leaked their chats and revealed a bunch of their internal operations and secrets. After that, Conti appeared to just shut down, walk away. But Misha says that's not true. Conti's still around. They still exist, but we don't see them. The way the market is set up now, you don't see real groups. You only see the hype. The danger of someone like Misha, who isn't running a hacking operation but is only too happy to lend a hand to those who do, is that he doesn't care much who gets targeted. It could be the government of Costa Rica one day and a small working-class town in the U.S. the next. Just ask Prospect Park, New Jersey. It's a small town. We're about just under like a square mile. This is Walter Richmond. He's the officer in charge of Prospect Park. We border the city of Patterson, which is one of the major cities in New Jersey. Um, actually, many of our streets we share with Patterson. Half of the street will be ours. Half of it will be uh, city of Patterson's. And this little town back in the summer of 2020 was attacked by the Lockbit Gang, a crew Misha had long been affiliated with. Walter was one of the first to realize what Misha and his buddies had allegedly done. I came in in the morning, and our police clerk had alerted us that she couldn't access any of the files. She was trying to scan and do her, you know, her clerical duties, and she couldn't access any of the files. So he went over to her computer, and his heart sank. And I noticed that all of our files on our server were of the Lockbit variant. They were changed, so we obviously have Word documents, usually your normal PDF-style documents, Excel, things like that, et cetera. But they were all now Lockbit as the file type. So, like, the extension on the file, instead of saying TXT or, or whatever it was, it would say Lockbit? Yes, so the extension of the files were, were all changed to Lockbit. Walter called the company that was running the city's IT operations and asked what he should do. And he immediately said, you know, do not log into any computers, tell everyone to not touch any other, you know, desktops or laptops in the vehicles, the police cars. But here's the strange thing. Walter said there was no ransom note. You know, no one reached out requesting a ransom or any, you know, the usual type of, uh, you know, activity. Attacks like these can be terrifying. A city like Prospect Park wouldn't expect to be a target of someone as notorious as Misha. But in an indictment released the day Misha became a cyber most wanted, the Justice Department claimed that he played a role in the Prospect Park attack. They said he was part of a conspiracy to lock up their computers. Why do you think he went after you guys? I'm not sure. It's, that's a really good question. 
Cybersecurity experts will tell you that hackers are targeting places like Prospect Park because they're low-hanging fruit. Cities typically don't have lots of money to spend on IT security teams. Misha, for his part, told us he wasn't involved. It was not me. It was other people. I just uploaded the data because I thought I needed to upload it. The information was available, he said, so he just grabbed it to prove that they really had the data. You see, a lot of Western cybersecurity companies think a lot of ransomware groups lie. I uploaded the data to prove that it really had been stolen and it wasn't a hoax. While the Prospect Park attack was relatively small ball, Misha's work with all those groups has authorities worried that he'll eventually be involved in something bigger. A ransomware attack that stops a city in its tracks. Some version of what happened in Dallas earlier this year. More fallout tonight from a ransomware attack on the city of Dallas. The cyber attack has now closed the municipal courts building and renewed concerns about the possible leak of city employees' personal data. The group that locked up the Dallas City system was a ransomware crew called Royal. They stole more than a terabyte of data, and they locked up Dallas computer systems, which had some real-world consequences. For weeks, there were no court hearings, no trials, and no jury duty. The concern is that attacks of this kind will become the new norm, and that people like Misha could help make more attacks like that happen which helps explain why the FBI is pulling out all the stops in its hunt for him. But actually, we found someone who was able to locate Misha, even identify him, and he's been interacting with him for years now. Stay with us. Azim Kojibayev started tracking Misha a few years ago. He's a senior analyst at a threat intelligence firm called Cisco Talos. So one of my research skills is to really deep dive into the human presence on the internet for individuals. And it turns out Misha had inadvertently left little digital footprints on the web, things he'd probably forgotten about. And Azim discovered them. Um, they made a small mistake in posting their both username and name in a very random forum post a very long time ago. Azim put that little piece of information together with other things he'd found. And then ultimately that same name uh, was uh, matched to a resume that indicated and matched a lot of this person's activities. So when Misha reached out to him, Azim responded by saying he knew who he was. He did not deny it. Um, his response was actually uh, very jovial, inquisitive as to how I found out. But because of that, it was, uh, in my experience, one of the biggest icebreakers I've ever had. Actually, your relationship with him was sort of born out of um, begrudged mutual respect? Uh, yes, and uh, it continues to be that way, it seems. Um, he has recently... Uh, has gone from a very negative attitude towards me to being uh, somewhat uh, cordial and even nice at times, uh, complimenting me one way or the other, um, which uh, I found that personally to be a little weird. A producer on our team spent weeks chasing Misha, and he eventually convinced him to talk to us just a few days after he was added to the FBI's most wanted hacker list. And Misha? seemed to be taking his new notoriety in stride. I was not surprised. I understood it was going to happen. We worked out a system with him where we'd text him questions in Russian, and then he'd respond to us with voice memos. And we didn't exactly have his full attention. It sounded like he was running errands while he was talking to us. Like at one point, we could hear Rihanna music playing in the background. 
Нет, есть только идея. На своем примере и своим поведением показать, что IT в России жив. At another moment, we could hear motorcycles rumbling past, like he was on the street walking home. And that's the weird thing about Misha. While he's being hunted by the FBI, he seems to spend a lot of time doing things that make it pretty easy to find him. Like sending us those voice memos or posting drunk videos on social media. Which, in addition to giving clues about where he is, shows law enforcement exactly what he looks like. In fact, one of his pictures on the most wanted list is pulled from one of those videos. Misha kind of looks like he sounds. Oh, shit, man. My workflow. He looks straight out of Hacker Central casting, like one of those guys in the bar who makes you instinctively move a couple of stools away just so you can avoid any drunken interaction. And he's always calling out cybersecurity analysts on social media, goading them. In this clip, he's boasting about all the things they'd learn if only they could get their hands on his laptop which he drunkenly hits with his hand. And all data security professionals in the USA, would you like to see something outstanding and more interesting that you have ever seen before? That's my working laptop. But Misha doesn't seem to worry that the FBI might be taking those videos or our voice memos and piecing them together to try to locate him. Are those the kinds of clues that you look for? To answer your question, I do look for those kinds of clues all the time. This is Azim from Cisco Talis again. He shares a lot of those kind of clues one way or the other. I don't particularly think he cares that he does that. He's been pretty open, for example, about where he's been living. Uh, In recent videos, uh, I think even within this year, perhaps, or within the last year and a half, um, he has claimed to be residing or traveling to the uh, Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, which is surrounded by uh, Poland and Latvia. Which actually isn't as much of a help for the FBI as it sounds. Russia doesn't hand over its cyber criminals. It's actually thought to encourage their overseas hacks. Which may be why Misha doesn't seem to care that he's dropping all these clues. He's given no signs of slowing down now that he's on the FBI's most wanted. In fact, he says he's cooking up some new plans, which, in a way, ironically, have something to do with the FBI. I want to show that IT in Russia is still alive and well. You don't need to go to the United States to make money. You don't need to go to the United States to study. I want to take Russian information technologies to the next level. Misha says he wants to help teach Russia's youth about cybersecurity to protect them from the prying eyes of the CIA and the FBI. I also have this idea of organizing a project to teach children cyber hygiene, to protect them from attacks of all sorts from CIA, FBI, who recruits our citizens. This is open information. They're talking about it themselves. No one does that in our country. You're coming after me, he seems to say to the FBI. I'm coming after you. This is Click Here. That was a story from Click Here, a podcast that tells true stories about the people making and breaking our digital world. It drops every Tuesday, and you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Click Here.